All right, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and uh, I've got a message prepared that, oh, I probably should have preached about six or seven months ago. I've had a lot of people about six, seven months ago, and, and from then on until today, emailing me all the time saying, Brother Breaker, please preach the message on this subject. Please, Brother Breaker, preach on the subject of the Trinity or the Godhead. And uh, I've been putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. I've already made a message about this in which I... Uh, made a message um, in our mystery series. We have the seven mysteries in the Bible, and one of those is the mystery of godliness, and I've already talked about that, and uh, that was, oh, what, two years ago, I guess, that I've talked about that, so I kind of was putting it off going, ah, you know, I already have a message about that, but so many people have emailed me and said, Brother Breaker, we need you to make a video about the Trinity. Help explain to us the Trinity. And uh, I've just been dealing with other subjects, and I've had this on my list for a long time, but I figured, well, let's go ahead and let's do this. Uh, let's go ahead and make this video and hope it will be a blessing to you. Uh, lots of people have asked me to do this. And many of them are ex-Jehovah Witnesses. And if you know, there's a cult within Christianity. They call themselves Christians. They really aren't because they don't really follow Christ and who Christ really is. Uh, matter of fact, they reject Jesus Christ. If you think about it, they call themselves Jehovah Witnesses. They believe only in a Jehovah in the Old Testament. They don't believe that Jesus is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. But they don't believe in the Trinity. And if you uh, come across these people that call themselves Jehovah Witnesses, they will tell you, oh, there's no such thing as the Trinity, there's no such thing as hell, and there, there's all these things that they reject that are clearly in the Bible. So I want to do this video to help those people who are struggling with those, those Jehovah Witnesses. A lot of times Jehovah Witnesses will come to your door, knock on your door, and say, hey, we'd like to talk to you about the kingdom. And uh, they, they really mess up people. They really get people messed up in their false doctrine. So this video will be to help you understand the Trinity. Now, here's the thing. What I'm going to do today, I'm going to deal with two different things. I'm going to talk about what the Trinity is, or maybe I should say who the Trinity is. But then I'm going to deal with, or try to deal with, and this is the hard part, how the Trinity works. Now that's what's so hard. It is called a mystery. It is called the mystery of Godliness. There is some things about the Trinity that are very hard to explain. So, although I can clearly explain to you what the Trinity is, and who it is, what, what it consists of, it will be very, very hard for me to explain to you how the Trinity works. So I'm going to attempt to do both, and if all I get is to explain what the Trinity is, and you understand that, then I feel like my mission is accomplished. At least you understand what the Trinity is. But I don't know if we'll ever fully understand how the Trinity is. So what I'll, I'll do is I'll explain that, and maybe you'll understand at the end of this video what I'm talking about when I say the who versus the how of the Trinity. Who the Trinity is, that's a no-brainer. I mean, that we'll start out right now in, in 1 John 5, 7, and we'll see exactly who the Trinity is. It's in the Bible. But how the Trinity is, now that's, oh, that's hard to explain. That's why it's a mystery. That's why it's something that's hard to get a hold of. And that's, and that's why people email me and say, please explain it, because it's hard for me to understand. It's how the Trinity works that is so hard for us to get. Because we're not God, and we are mortal flesh, and it's very hard for us to understand how the eternal works, and how an eternal being can, can do what he does. So let's begin in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7 as we begin here our study today on the Trinity. Now I called it what the Bible calls it, the Godhead. The word Trinity, by the way, is not in the Bible. The word Godhead is. And uh, it's quite interesting how many times the word Godhead is in the Bible. And I'll get to that in a minute. But I want to start here with 1 John, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. 1 John 5 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So the Bible clearly tells us what the Trinity is. It's the Father, God the Father, the Word, which is Jesus, God the Son, and the Holy Ghost, God the Spirit. So we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. These three are one. So it's not three different gods. It's one God in three parts. This is the Trinity. Now, right off the bat, as soon as I finish reading this verse, some people will say, well, that verse shouldn't be in the Bible. 
You know, Jehovah's Witnesses say, well, we don't even have that verse in our Bible. Why do you have it in your Bible? Well, let me tell you why. Because it's supposed to be there. If you go to the Greek Texas Receptus, and you look at this verse, and you know Greek. Now, I had three years Greek in college, and, uh, you know, I don't like Greek. I don't need Greek. I have a King James Bible, which was translated correctly from the correct Greek text, so I don't really need Greek. But I did take it. I did study it. I did learn it. First of all, without verse 7 in the text... Your Greek language is not grammatically correct. So if you take out verse 7 that I just read, and many, many people, they claim that shouldn't be in the Bible, then the Greek text is grammatically incorrect in the Greek language. So that is a strong evidence and confirmation that this verse belongs in the Bible. Secondly, these people will come to you, these so-called Greek scholars, and they will say, well, you know, uh, the oldest texts don't have 1 John 5, 7. Well, it doesn't matter if they're older texts or not. Without this verse 7, the gra gra grammar of the Greek is incorrect. But they say the older texts don't have that. That is a lie from the pits of hell. Someone is lying to you. The older texts do have this. What they are calling the older text are the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, Sinaiticus manuscripts, which are 400 to 600 years after Jesus. And someone within that time, uh, 400 to 600 years after Jesus, took out this verse. Clearly it was there before because the grammar in the Greek does not read correctly without ver this verse. But also we have 100, 200 years after Jesus, we have what are called the Church Fathers. Now there was a man years ago named Dean Burgeon. Dean Burgeon, I believe he started some sort of Bible society, the Dean Burgeon Society or something. No, no, somebody started that Bible society after him, uh, thinking about him. But Dean Burgeon was some sort of a dean of a college in England in the 1600s, uh, 1800s. And Dean Burgeon collected something like, if I remember correctly, 30,000 quotes from the Church Fathers. And he found that 1 John 5-7 was quoted 100 and 200 years after Jesus Christ. So, if they quoted 1 John 5-7 100 and 200 years after Jesus, then it must have been in their Bibles. Amen? I don't care if you say the oldest manuscripts don't have it. The oldest manuscripts are 500, 400, 600 years after Jesus. 200 years after Jesus, we have the testimony of 1 John 5, 7. So it should be in the Bible. The other thing I want to say is some people will say, well, what about Erasmus? You see, what I'm doing is I'm giving you the arguments of people that hate the Trinity and don't believe it should be in the Bible. Many of them say, well, it shouldn't be in the Bible because this, that, and the other thing. But if you study it for yourself, you find out 1 John 5, 7 has always been in the Bible. But there was a man named Erasmus in the 1500s, and Erasmus put out a Greek text based upon these Greek texts that he's found all over the Byzantine Empire, and his first edition of his Greek and Latin text did not have 1 John 5, 7 in it. And he printed that in, what, 1516, 1517? And so people say, 1 John 5, 7 should be in the Bible. Well, he went around and he said, look, if you could just show me one text that has 1 John 5, 7 in it, I'll put it in the Bible. And I can't remember if it was his second, his third, or his fourth uh, reprinting of his Greek and Latin Greek uh, text, Erasmus put 1 John 5, 7 into the text. Because he did find evidence that 1 John 5, 7 should be in the Bible. So if you're one of those people that goes around and says, well, 1 John 5, 7 shouldn't be in the Bible, you can just go ahead and click on something else. You're not going to believe anything that I have to say in the rest of this video. Because your mind is made up and you believe that there is no Trinity. And I'm sorry for you. Because I'm going to prove to you from the scriptures what the Trinity is and that there is one. And I hope you, you stick with this and I hope you watch this. But don't ever give in to someone that tells you that 1 John 5, 7 shouldn't be in the Bible. Because it is in our Bible, in the King James Bible. And it is found a hundred years after Jesus in quotes from early church fathers. And the Greek text does not even make sense grammatically without this verse. So, we begin our study on the Trinity in 1 John 5, 7, a, a verse that many people debate, but there's really no debate. It's a verse that is scriptural, a verse. And you know why do they debate it? Because Satan hates the Trinity. Satan wants to attack it. <laughs> so we're not going to give Satan the time of day. We're going to look at this as scripture. We're going to say 1 John 5, 7 is the word of God. It is 
uh, divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it is the Word of God. And the Word of God tells us there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So we have one God with three parts. So this verse tells us about the Trinity, or what I like to call the Godhead. Now many people will, will come to you, like I had a phone call not too long ago, a guy screaming at me on the phone saying, Don't you ever talk about the Trinity! The Trinity's not in the Bible! And I said, okay, well the doctrine is. He says, well the word's not, so you can't use the word Trinity. So some people will tell you, well the Trinity's not in the Bible, the Trinity's not in the Bible. Where does the word Trinity come from? Well, that's a word that we make up. We call it the Trinity. Uh, the triune Godhead, the triune uh, God. So a lot of people say, well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, so you can't use the word Trinity. Okay, well, what word is in the Bible? The word Godhead is in the Bible. Now, I don't mind using the word Trinity. I have no problem with that. You know, the Bible doesn't use the word rapture. The word rapture is not in the Bible, but the doctrine is. So it's not wrong to use a word that's not found in the Bible as long as the doctrine itself is found in the Bible. But it's interesting, the word the Trinity is not found in the Bible, but the word Godhead is. And so I went and I looked up the word Godhead, and guess how many times the word Godhead shows up in the Bible? Three. <laughs> so the Trinity is one God with three parts, and in the Bible, the Trinity, the word used in the Bible, is Godhead, and it's, it's used three times. It shows us that God is a Trinity. He has three parts. I thought that was interesting. So Godhead is used three parts in the Bible. So let's quickly look at those. Let's go to Acts chapter 17, and verse 29. Then we'll go to Romans 1.20, then we'll go to Colossians 2.9. And I'll just show you each of the three times that the word Godhead is used in the Bible. God is a one God with three parts. He is a triune God, or He is a trinity. Acts chapter 17, verse 29, and we find the word Godhead, and it says, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. So the Godhead. So clearly the Bible says, do not think that God is an idol. That's what it's talking about here is the worship of idols. Uh, the heathen, the pagans in the time of Paul, they worship idols. And those idols were made of gold or of silver or of stone. And people used to uh, worship a little statue and say, oh my God, you are my God. No, no, God's not like that. God is far greater. God is the creator of all things. A piece of wood or a piece of uh, statue of, of, of gold or silver, that is not God. Our God's alive. Those things are dead. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 is the second time that we see the word Godhead. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So here is the second time we see the term Godhead. And notice it's always a capital G, because it's the true God. In the Bible, when it's a lowercase g, well, that's the false God. And then Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9 is the last time, the third time, interesting, three times the word Godhead shows up. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9 says, For in Him... The context is verse 8, Christ, so Jesus. For in him, Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So here is the Godhead, and, can, and it's uh, talking about Jesus. So included in the Godhead is Jesus Christ. So in Jesus Christ is the Godhead. So this verse tells about the Trinity or the Godhead. And uh, these three verses, Acts 17, 29, Romans 1, 20, and Colossians 2, 9, talk about the Godhead. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to talk about the Godhead or the Trinity. I'm going to tell you what it is, or basically who it is. But then I'm going to try to explain how it works. And that's where we get into problems. It's so hard for us to understand how the Trinity can be. Because we are simple-minded people. We are not God. We are so far away from God. It's so hard to understand how God thinks. And it's so hard for us to think the same way. So many people have a hard time understanding the Godhead or the Trinity. I don't know why, because it's easy to understand what it is or who it is. But then I see how difficult it is to understand how it is. So let me get into that. Let me start with this teaching on who the Godhead is, or what it is. And then we'll look at how it works. 
So first of all, we'll begin in Genesis chapter 1. Now what we need to understand is God is a God with three parts. He is one God. He is not three gods. Some people who hate the teaching of the Trinity try to say, well, you Christians, you believe in three gods. No, you don't. No, I don't. I don't believe in three gods. I believe in one God. But that one God has three parts. So in Genesis chapter 1, and we go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, God is speaking. And it's funny, the word God in Hebrew is Elohim. Elohim. When you see the, a word in Hebrew that ends in im, that's a plural word. So the word for God in Hebrew is a plural word. Yet it's one God, but it's plural. So it's one God with three parts. It's quite interesting that the word itself is a plural word. But in verse 26 it says, And God said, okay, so God is speaking. Look at how God speaks about himself. This is odd. This is really, really strange. He says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. <laughs> so God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So God says something, and God says, Let us do this in our image, in our likeness. Now who talks like that? If it were me talking, I'd say, let me make man in my image. It would be me, my. I wouldn't say our. Our and us means there's more than one. But that's how God talks. God says, let us make man in our image. So God speaks of himself as a plural. When God talks, he talks as though he was more than one. Now, he's not more than one. There's not more than one God. It's one God with three parts. But it's interesting how God addresses and speaks to himself with the pronouns us and our. Now, in order for us to understand God and what God is, I think the easiest way for us to understand is look at ourselves. Because we're told here in the scriptures that God made man in his image. So we are made in the image of God. So if we're going to understand God, maybe we need to understand ourselves. And it's amazing to me how you have within Christianity all these so-called de denominations that claim to be Christians. They don't read the Bible. They don't study the Bible. They don't understand the Bible. And they don't even understand who they are. Who are we? 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Notice, we're going to study today, we're going to look at who or what the Trinity is, and then we're going to look at how it works. Now, what is the Trinity? All right, let's go to this verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. I'm going to put two S's there. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 gives us what a man is, and a woman for that much. And the Bible tells us exactly what we are. Remember, we are created in God's image. If God is one God with three parts, then wouldn't we be one with three parts? And that's what it comes out. That's what the Bible teaches, is that we are one individual, one person, but we are made up of three very distinct separate parts. That doesn't make us three people. That makes us one individual with three parts. We are one person with three parts. First Thessalonians. 5.23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless into the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Apostle Paul, and wouldn't it be Paul? Paul's always telling us such good stuff. Paul tells us that we are made up of a spirit, we are made up of a soul, and we are made up of a body. We have three parts. We are one person but we are made up of three separate parts. It's almost like a football. I don't know if you like to play football, but I do. Uh, not always. I'm not very good at it. But a football is one football, but it's made up of three parts. Outside of the football is the skin, the pig skin. Inside of that football is a bladder. And the inside of that football is air. Now, if I were to take all the air out of that football, could I go play football? I couldn't because it'd be flat and I couldn't throw it. I couldn't get that spin. If I took the bladder outside of that football and I tried to fill it up with air, could I play football? No. It'd be going 
and all the air would go out. That, that rubber bladder inside literally holds the air in. If I took the bladder out, the air would leak out. What if I took the skin off, that pig skin? Could I play football? It would be very hard to play football with that little bladder, that, that slippery little, little bladder. So I have to have one football, but I have to have all three parts in order to use that football. So those three parts, well, well that pretty much corresponds with the body. The body is like the skin, that's the outside. And the air is like the spirit inside, and then the soul is like that bladder. So as a football has three parts, and, and I need all three parts in order to play football, a human being is like that. It's one person with three parts. It's not three different person, persons. No one would look at a football and say, look at that football, it's three different footballs. It's one football, but it consists of the three parts, and without the three parts, you can't use it. It won't work. So man is one man made of three parts. We are made of three different distinct parts, but there's only one of us. And when you look at me, you see my outside, you see my body. Inside of my body is my soul. You can't see that. And inside of that is the spirit. So I am made up of three parts. You're looking at Robert Breaker, but you're only looking at the outside of Robert Breaker. You're not seeing the inside, the inward, what the Bible calls the inward man. So we're made in God's image. And if we are made of three parts, but yet we're one person, then God must be one God with three parts. One person with three parts. And that's what God is. God is a trinity. We are, and I like to use this, we are a triune being. I like to use that little saying. We are a triune being. That means we are a being made up of three parts. Just as God is a trinity, He is one God with three parts. Now, what would the three parts of God be? Well, there, there you go. That's a good question. What are the three parts of God? What is God made of? Well, if God is made of a spirit and a soul and a body, what would the Spirit of God be? Well, clearly, if you know your Bible, that would be the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. I'll abbreviate it there, Holy Ghost. If the body is Jesus, Jesus took on like sinful flesh, yet without sin, Jesus came down from heaven in a body like ours, then clearly Jesus Christ would be the body. So what would that make the soul? Well, there's only one left. You know, Jesus is the one we read in uh, 1 John 5, 7. He's the Word. So the only thing left is the Father. So God the Father somehow must correspond with the soul, I guess. So... God has three parts. He, he is a spirit, soul, and body. And somehow, when He created us, He took what He was and He made us in His image. So we have a spirit, a soul, and a body. Now, here's the problem. When we are born in this world, we are born in a fallen state. And because we are born in a fallen state, we are born sinners, we have a problem. Okay, here I am, okay? Here's this illustration of me, just like this illustration of the football. Here's my outside, here's my body, okay? I'm born in this world, and inside my body, you can't see it, but that's my soul. And inside the soul is the spirit. Now, that spirit, according to the Bible, is born dead. So my spirit is born dead, so I'm born with a dead spirit. You know what that makes me? That makes me two-thirds of a man. So when I'm born in this world, I'm born with a live body with a soul inside of it. But I have a dead spirit. I'm not whole. I'm only two-thirds. Two-thirds in fractional form is .666. Now that's an awful number, 666. But you know what that number is? In the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 18, the Bible tells us that's the number of a man. Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of the man. Number of a man. Amen. And his number is 603 score and 6. Now why is a man's number the same number as the number of the beast? Why does the Bible say the number of the beast is the number of a man? That 666 is the number of a man? Well, if you look at what a man is and what he's made up of, and you look at the Bible says that when we're born in this world, our spirit is born dead because of the sin of Adam and Eve, then it makes sense. We're only two-thirds whole. We have a dead spirit. 
So this is what you're like when you're born. This is what every person that's born into this world is. This is what a lost person is. They don't have the Spirit of God. Now, when you get saved, when you get born again, I guess I'll put up here. When you get saved, it's a little bit different. Because when you get saved, something happens. And things get a lot better when you're saved. When you get saved, the Bible says the Holy Spirit of God comes inside of you and dwells inside of you. Now, I'm going to put the Spirit in red because the Bible says you're washed in the blood. So in order to make it look like we have a filling in the Spirit, I have to have some color. So I'm going to use red in order to fill it. When a person trusts the gospel and gets saved, they are filled with the Holy Spirit of promise, the Holy Spirit of God. And that Holy Spirit goes inside of their spirit and dwells inside of them. And the Bible says that what we're supposed to do is reckon the flesh dead. So we're supposed to look at the body and say, okay, now body, you're dead. I don't want you to have what you want. Whatever you want, you can't have. But the Bible says now that the soul has been washed in the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit is inside. The Bible calls that the new creature. And that is the soul of the man with the Holy Spirit inside. Now, this is the difference between a saved man and a lost man. A saved person has the Holy Spirit of God inside of them. But they're still two-thirds. Why? Because they're still in a sinful body. Not until the rapture do they get a glorified body and they become whole. But they have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit inside of them is what makes them what the Bible calls a new creature. And in Ephesians 1.13, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. When you get saved, when you get born again by trusting the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15.1-4, trusting the blood atonement of Christ, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You have God's Spirit inside of you. And you go to heaven when you die. So the Bible talks about us, what we are, and where we come from. And where we come from is we're born from our parents. And this is how we look when we're born. We're born with an outward body. We all have a body. We all have a soul, but our spirit is dead. That's why we must be born anew. That's why we need the spiritual birth. That's why we need to be saved, because the spirit is dead. Now, what happens when you die? Well, in Genesis chapter 35 and verse 18, it tells us when a person dies, their soul is in departing, so their soul leaves their body. That's what takes place, is when you die, your soul leaves your body. If you're saved, and you die, and you leave the body, why, the Holy Spirit inside takes you to heaven. But if you're lost and you die, what happens? That soul goes whoosh, straight down, straight to hell. The Bible talks about in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 39, the saving of the soul. What the Bible is for, it's a book given to us to tell us about who God is and what God did for us. And what God did was He died in our place for our sins. He shed His blood. And if you trust the blood of Jesus Christ, then you can be forgiven and your soul can be saved and go to heaven when you die. That's why it's so important to be saved. And when you get saved, then you become a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says... Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So we become a new creature in Christ when we trust the blood atonement, the blood that Jesus shed for our sins. So this is lost person, saved person. So what do we call this when a person gets saved? What takes place? Well, that's what takes place is they become a new creature and there is a spiritual birth that takes place. How do we get this spiritual birth? It's a birth of the Spirit. Remember, you're born with a dead spirit. So in order to have that spirit come to life, there must be something taking place. What we call this is being born again. How do you get born again? 1 Corinthians 4, 15 says, For though you have 10,000 instructors of Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus have I begotten you through the gospel. So Paul says that it's the gospel that saves us, and that the gospel is how we get the new birth, or we get our spirit born. The gospel, of course, is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And when you believe the gospel, there is a new birth that takes place. 
is the spiritual birth. Now, I'm not talking about this body. Now, there's some people that say in the future, the rapture, there's a birth of a body. You know, that's something completely different. I'm not talking about that today. What I'm talking is what the Bible calls the birth of the Spirit. This is what we call born of the Spirit. Oh, there's so many verses on that. Let me go to uh, John chapter 3. You see, we're born in this world, we're born wrong. We're born without the Spirit of God. And we're born in this world and our soul is not saved. We're the old man, we're the old creature, and that old man is lost. That's why we need to be born anew, born of the Spirit. So when Jesus was here, he was talking, and Jesus says in John chapter 3, in verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he says there in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So the first birth is the birth of the flesh, but the Spirit's dead. The next birth is when our spirit is born anew through the blood of Christ. We trust that. That's when the Holy Spirit comes in and our spirit is reborn through Christ. Verse 8 says, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. What does it mean to be born of the Spirit? Well, Paul talked about it in Galatians chapter 4. Let's go there. Galatians chapter 4, verse 29. Galatians 4, 29, Paul says, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. So someone is born after the Spirit. Now, 1 John talks about this a little bit. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that believeth him that begetteth loveth him also that is begotten of him. Uh, 1 John 3 9 says, oh, we've got to go back. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9 says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So what we call this, we call this the new birth. This is called being born of the Spirit, or born of God. This is the spiritual birth. And if you're not saved, then you've never been born again spiritually. You don't have the Holy Spirit inside of you. So you're lost. And if you die, you'll go straight down. And what will happen to someone that dies and goes straight down? Well, that is found in Luke chapter 16. And it's kind of sad. Everyone must be born again or they go to hell. That's what Jesus said. In Luke chapter 16, we see a guy that went to hell. Luke chapter 16 and verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Verse 20, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid in his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. Okay, When the rich man died and was buried, his body was buried. But his soul was in departing. His soul left. Where did his soul end up? When he died, because he didn't have the Holy Spirit, his soul went down. And in verse 23 it says, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And there he says in verse 24, I am tormented in this flame. So if you do not get born of the Spirit, if you are not born again, when you die, your body separates, and, and your soul leaves your body, and the body is put in the grave, and the soul goes to hell and burns. That's why it's important to be born of the Spirit. Get that new birth, that spiritual birth, because when you come to Christ, trust the gospel, trust the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. Through faith, you're saved. The Holy Spirit comes in, dwells inside of you. And then what happens? Well, because you have the Holy Spirit, when the body dies, the Holy Spirit takes you up. And where is that in the Bible? Why, that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul is talking to people that are saved, that are born of the Spirit, that are born again. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says these words, 2 Corinthians 5, 6. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. But then in verse 8, For we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body, and to be present with the Lord. 
So if you are a Christian that's truly saved by trusting the gospel and you have the Holy Spirit inside of you and you're sealed with that Holy Spirit, you are a new creature, the Bible calls you. If that body dies, that soul is present with the Lord. It goes to heaven. But if you're not saved and you die, that soul goes straight down to hell. And that's why it is so important to be saved. The Bible says in Psalms 9.17, The wicked shall be turned into hell in all nations that forget God. So this is what the Bible teaches about us. This is what we are, and this is what the Trinity is. It's so simple to explain what the Trinity is and who it is. It's a body, soul, and spirit. God said He made us in His image. What is God's image? God is a spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. He's a soul, and He's a body. His body is, is Jesus. So God says, look, what I am, I'm going to make men like me. And so he did. He made men with a spirit, soul, and body. The only problem is Adam sinned and lost the Holy Spirit. And every time Adam had a son, and he had a son, and he had a son, all those children were born without the Spirit of God. And so their spirit was dead. And so when they died, they went to hell unless they came to God for salvation. So this is what the Trinity is. The Trinity is one person with three parts. Everybody that's alive today has these three parts. One of them's dead. That's why we need to be saved. When we get saved, we're still we're made up of three parts. We consist of three separate parts. So it's easy to see that God is one God with three parts. How does anyone deny that? How does anyone say that that's not true? I've showed you verse after verse that God is one God with three parts. He's not three gods. We don't look at God and say, well, God is three different gods. He's God the Father, and that's one God. He's God the Jesus, that's another God, and He's God the Holy Spirit. No, it's all one God, but with three parts. So to understand the Trinity is to understand ourselves, because we are made in God's image. So we are three parts. Now, I don't understand how anyone could deny that we are made up of three parts, but yet there are some people that do. I think it was, was it Presbyterians or one of those denominations, they believe in a dichotomy rather than a triune being. They say, oh, you're just a body and a soul. There's no such thing as a spirit. Well, then why did the Apostle Paul say in 1, Timoth 1 Thessalonians 5.23 that your spirit, soul, and body? Why would he say we have three parts if we only had two? So this is clear. This is, this is easy to understand. This is the easy part to get a hold of. This is who the Trinity is or what it is. It's one God, three parts. One person, three parts. So this is, let me write it up here, one God, three parts. Not three gods, one God, three parts. Now here's the hard part. <laughs> we looked at this now. Here's the how. Here's what's different. God is different than us because God can do something that we can't do. God can take his three parts and he can separate himself anytime he wants, any way he wants. So he can take the three parts and separate them. I can't do that. I wish I could. I wish I could go lay down in my body in the bed back there and then say, you know what, I've never been to Hawaii and just raise up in my soul and just, or maybe even my spirit, just by a spirit, just go visit Hawaii and look around. And then tell my soul, now go to the store and get me some potato chips, you know. And just anytime I want to just separate all three parts of me, but I can't do that. The only way that I can separate is at death. And death is what separates my body from the rest of me. So the only way that my three parts get separated is at death. Death is when things change. And that's when I leave my body. Now I hope the rapture comes first so I don't ever have to taste death. But death separates me. But God can do something that we can't do. Now this is what's so hard to understand. How He can do this. God can separate His three parts into three different parts. It still makes up one God, but He's one God with three parts. Now let me show you that. Let's give you an example. Let's go to Matthew chapter 3. What God can do, I can't do. I cannot separate myself. But God can, and He does. And this is what's hard to understand about the Trinity. This is why a lot of people don't believe in a Trinity, because they go, well, I just can't understand this part. I don't understand how God can do this. Well, you don't have to understand it. You're just supposed to believe it. <laughs> the easy part is to know that God is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's the three-part God, but He's one God with three parts. That's, that's easy. 
But how God can separate those three parts any way He wants, any time He wants, that's what's so hard to get a hold of. Go to Matthew chapter 3, and here we see God in three dis separate, distinct places at one time. He's one God with three parts, but He's in three different places at once. Here's Jesus Christ on earth. And we read in verse 13, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. So here comes Jesus, God the Son, walking up to John. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. 16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway up, out straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Now wait a minute, here's Jesus, just got baptized, it came up, now the Holy Spirit's coming to him. How, how come it's not in him? How come it's coming down to him? You see, he separated himself. I don't know how he did it, but he did. But that's not all. And then as the Holy Spirit's coming down, verse 17, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, who is this? If he says, this is my Son, then that must be the Father. So here you have Jesus Christ here, Holy Spirit's up here, and God the Father's up here. And so Jesus gets baptized here on earth, Holy Spirit starts to come down on him, and God the Father in a voice says, now that's my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Look how he's in three different places at one time. One God, three different places. Explain that. <laughs> I can't. I don't know how to do that. Um, Jesus Christ is God. There's no doubt of that. We read in the Bible in 1 John 3, 16. Now some people will go to this passage and say, well, that shouldn't be in the Bible. Yes, it should. Here we have another passage that scholars who don't believe in the Word of God try to change. I've seen the old text, and what they do is someone has erased this. You go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 16, and it says, God was manifest in the flesh. And the text has God. The old way that they wrote God was like this. They abbreviated God, Theos, like that in the old text. Well, they have a text that did this, and somebody came along, and they took that little thing, and they kind of rubbed it out. But there was still a little dot there to where you know that was God. This, if you take out that line, says He in Greek. This says God. So the right texts in Greek say God was manifest in the flesh, and it's talking about Jesus. The false texts, that even if you look under a microscope, you can tell someone tried to erase, say, He was manifest in the flesh. Who is He? No, clearly the King James Bible says God was manifest in the flesh. So there is no debate on who this is. This is God. Jesus Christ is God. 1 Timothy 3.16 And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. So Jesus Christ is God. There's no doubt about that. So if Jesus is God, then there's only one God. But God can do something that we can't do. God can take himself and separate his three parts. And what Jesus, God, did was he came down from heaven to the earth. And he was born of a virgin. Now you figure that out. I don't know how that happened. All I know is it did, and I believe it. And in Luke chapter 1, we read about how God came down through the, somehow the Holy Spirit planted in Mary the seed of Jesus Christ, God. So somehow God humbled himself to come down to be born of a virgin. Luke chapter 1, verse 30, we read, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So somehow Jesus Christ came down from heaven onto earth. So he separated himself, and he came down and he took a body, and he was born of a virgin. Now when Jesus Christ was down here on earth, God the Father was in heaven. So somehow God separated himself. 
So, and it looks like God the Holy Spirit was on heaven until He came down when Jesus was baptized. So you've got, somehow, Jesus, God, Holy Spirit, matter of fact, let me show you this too. Uh, go to Acts chapter 5. I want you to see that the Holy Spirit is also God in the Bible. Uh, we need to go to Acts chapter 5. you got to understand, God the Father is God, God the Son, Jesus Christ is God, and God the Holy Spirit is God. That's what the Bible teaches. Uh, Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, there was a guy named uh, Ananias who lied against God. And uh, look what he says here. Acts chapter 5, verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And then you read verse 4. He says, Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Verse 3 said he lied to the Holy Ghost. Verse 4 said he lied to God. What is this saying? This is saying that the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, is God. So Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Well, if that's the case, then what is God the Father? Well, God the Father in the Old Testament says, I am God. Besides me, there is none else. So God the Father is God. And there are some places where Jesus calls the Father, God the Father. So God the Father is God. God the Holy Spirit is God. God the Son, Jesus, is God. He is God the Son. So it's one God with three parts, but somehow He can do something that I can't do. I cannot, just because I want to, say, you know what, I'm going to leave my body today and just go exploring in my spirit. Well, you know what, I'm just going to send my soul to the post office and just stand here in my body. I cannot separate myself, but God can. And that's hard for me to understand because I can't, but He can. And so when Jesus Christ was here on the earth, let me show you some places what He says. Matthew chapter 10, verse 33. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. So Jesus Christ is on earth, and he says, my Father is in heaven. Matthew chapter 16, verse 17. Jesus is speaking, he says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. Jesus is on earth, and he says, the Father is in heaven. Matthew 18, 10, look what he says. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. Over and over and over, while Jesus is here on earth, he keeps saying the Father's in heaven, but I'm down here. And Jesus Christ is God, and the Father is God. How can they be in two different places at once? I don't know. Here Jesus is telling his disciples how to pray in Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, he says, and you pray like this, and he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Pray to the Father in heaven. Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 17 is praying. In Luke chapter 17 and verse 1, Jesus said, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also might glorify thee. So Jesus Christ is on earth, and he looks up to heaven and he says, Father? So God the Father is in heaven and God the Son is down here on the earth. How can God separate himself? I don't know. Well, Jesus dies, is buried, and rose again. That's the gospel. How did he do it? By shedding his blood. Whose blood? Acts 20:28 20, says it's God's blood. He purchased the church, God, with his own blood. Whose blood? It was Jesus' blood. So Jesus must be God. And you go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 33, and look what it says. Jesus Christ raises again from the dead and goes up into heaven. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 33, it says, Where therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, which hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. So Jesus Christ went up to heaven to the right hand of the Father. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12, it says he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12 says, but this man, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Who is that? That must be God the Father. Uh, Hebrews 1.3, again, speaking about that, says, Hebrews 1.3, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and holding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. 
So Jesus Christ came down from heaven while God the Father was still up there. Jesus died, was buried, rose again, went up, and the Bible says he sat down on the right hand of the Father. So here's the Father's throne. This is the throne of God the Father. And God the Father is sitting in that throne somehow. And I'm not good at drawing thrones. And then the Son has a throne right beside the throne of God the Father. And God the Son is sitting right here. So somehow, God can separate his body from his soul, from his spirit. And they can be in different places. Now here's the wildest part. When Jesus was here on earth, he said, you know, when I go away, I'm going to send to you the Comforter. Who is the Comforter? The Comforter is the Holy Spirit. So God says, when I'm in heaven, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit down. So look at this. John chapter 14, verse 26. So the Holy Spirit is also called the Comforter. So God, John chapter 14, verse 26, look at what God the Son says about God the Holy Spirit. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, well, doesn't make much more clear than that, the Comforter is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Uh, John 15, 26. Or, yeah, 26. He says here, but when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father. Okay, first he says the Father will send, then he says I'm going to send. Even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father shall he testify of me. Now, verse 16, uh, chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So here's Jesus saying, I'm going to go up to heaven and then I'm going to send the Comforter. So the Holy Spirit comes down. So what do we have in heaven? We have God the Father and God the Son sitting on two different thrones right next to each other. And they say, now it's your turn, Holy Spirit, go down to the earth. How? <laughs> I, 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 this is why the Trinity is hard for people to understand. They don't understand how God can separate himself. Now, the Bible goes even farther. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it tells us what happens when you get saved. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession of the praise of His glory. So the Holy Spirit of promise is the Holy Spirit of God, the Comforter. When you get saved, the Bible says you get the Holy Spirit and it dwells inside of you. Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 through 16, says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Where does the Spirit go? When you get saved, when you trust the gospel, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit of God comes inside of the believer. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse 12, we read, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now look at 3.16. Tie this thing together. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? The Holy Spirit dwells inside of a believer. All right, In America, they say there's about 350 million people that live in America. I don't know how many of those people in America are saved. I'll just say, what if one in three in America are saved? I don't know if that's a high figure. I don't know if that's a low figure, but I've got to start somewhere. That would be a hundred. Well, let me, just, let me just guess. What if a hundred million people in America were saved? Now, America probably has the most Christians of any place in the world. So what if, if you take the whole population of the whole world, there's like seven billion people. What if you could find, I don't know, 400 million people in the rest of the world that were saved. That's probably a high figure. There's probably way less people. What if there were 500 million people in the entire world that were saved and had the Holy Spirit inside of them? Now that's probably a high figure. I'm probably way high. <laughs> but uh, I have to guess. You know, I'm just guessing. What if 5 million people in the world were saved? Do you know what that means? That means the Holy Spirit of God would be inside of five different million different people 
And every one of them is in a different place. How does that work? What if it's only 100 million in the entire world? I don't know how many people are saved. What I'm trying to show you is that the Holy Spirit of God is in a lot of different places at once. Because the Holy Spirit of God is inside of every believer. And there's believers all over the world. And each one of them has God dwelling inside of them in the Holy Spirit. How is that possible? How does that work? I don't know. <laughs> That's the easy answer. You see, it's easy to figure out who the Spirit, uh, who the Trinity is. I can tell you easy. The Trinity, well, that's easy. That's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 1 John 5, 7, that's the Trinity. It's one God with three parts. It's the Word, it's the Father, and it's the Spirit. But how does God divide Himself in such a way that He can take His body and put it down here on the earth while his soul is in heaven, God the Father. And yet he can take his spirit and divide his spirit up among all believers in which his spirit literally dwells in each one of us that are saved. Now maybe that's a high figure. It probably is. 500 million people saved. There's probably way less than that um, in the world today that are saved. Most of the world's lost, unfortunately. But how does God do that? How does God divide himself? I, I don't know. So do you see what I'm trying to say? That it's... It's easy in one sense to understand the Trinity because we understand what it is. What the Trinity is, that's easy. It's God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We are made in His image, so we understand clearly that we are a body, soul, and spirit. We're three parts, but we're one just as He's one God with three parts. He's not three different gods. He's one God with three parts. I understand that. I got that. That is so easy to understand. Now, how on earth does God, how can He be in so many million different places at once when he's inside the heart of every believer. How can he separate himself when I can't do that? That's what I can't explain. That's why it's called the mystery of God. It's a mystery is something that we look at and we just go, I can't figure that out. So the Trinity, in a way, is an easy understanding, an easy doctrine to understand because we understand what it is. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. No problem. But when we try to figure out how the Trinity works, that's when our brains go and steam and smoke starts coming out our ears. There's just some things that we in a fallen sinful state just can't seem to get. I don't understand how God can do that. I do not understand how God can take himself and separate it. How he can be sitting in two different thrones. One is the Son and one is the Father. And how he can send his Spirit to where it's inside so many different people at one time. I'll never understand until I get to heaven. And I can't wait. I'm looking forward to that. Amen. But until I get there, all I can try to do is explain to you the mystery of the Trinity. And I hope you understand that the Trinity is one God with three parts. Just as you are a triune being. You are one person with three parts. Now, finally, let me close. What are you going to do with your three parts? Do you care that your spirit is dead if you're lost? If so, are you going to uh, come to Jesus for salvation to get the Holy Spirit? You see, without the Holy Spirit, you can't go to heaven. How about your, your body? It's going to die someday. Have you made preparations for that? Have you come to Jesus for the cleansing of your sins? so your soul might be washed in the blood of the Lamb. See, salvation is important, and Jesus is the only way to be saved. When you trust Jesus, then the Holy Spirit comes inside. So let me ask you this. Are you saved? Do you understand the Trinity? I mean, I hope you do. If you do understand the Trinity, that's good. But what good is it to understand it if you don't believe it and accept it and trust Christ as your Savior? Please come to Jesus. Please read the Gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Read the Gospel. Get saved if you're not. And if you are, maybe pass this along. Help people understand what the Trinity is. Thank you for watching. I hope this has been a blessing. We'll see you next time.